Good afternoon and welcome to ASAP Online. My name is John Haldane and I serve as pastor at Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Holt of New Jersey. I'm delighted that you can be here with me for this new edition, I guess, if you will, of our decades-long Bible study tradition here at Prince of Peace, ASAP Adult Study and Fellowship now has gone online through the gift of technology. So I'm grateful that you can be a part of this meeting today as we continue to focus on Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And the opening theme for this week is, of course, as I've written on the board and talked about in the bulletin, it's not all about me. Theme for all of us to consider. So, dear sisters and brothers in Christ, friends in faith, I'd like to invite you now to join me in a word of prayer to get our time of study together today started. Let us pray. O oh, loving and gracious God, in a world that sometimes can seem to be overwhelmed with abundant conflict, we are grateful that your abundant love continues to hold us in a way that can never be broken. We thank you, O oh Lord, for opportunities to continue to reflect on the witness and leadership of leaders that you have raised up in the past in situations of conflict and strife, and how you use them to witness to the power of love and to hold human community in unity. We ask, O Lord, that as we continue to study the work of your servant, St. Paul, and his correspondence with Christians in Corinth, that your Holy Spirit might continue to move among us so that we might indeed internalize wisdom from these ancient conversations and use that wisdom in life-giving and healing ways in the world today. Thank you again, O oh Lord, for all the ways that you continue to bless us and be with us now and always. For we pray these things in your holy and life-giving name, O oh Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, 1 Corinthians, we're going to be looking at chapter 6 and chapter 10 this day. A little bit of review, you may remember from our first session, one of the key themes that was being raised up was this understanding of Paul trying to focus on Christ coming to us as crucified and risen. That is a, a wisdom that blows away worldly wisdom. It is the wisdom of God where, where strength is shown through sacrificial love. And the best expression of that sacrificial love is in the cross event on Good Friday. So, so Christ has called us, and Paul took up that call, to, to strive in loving service and sacrifice for the neighbor. That theme continues to be a rich one for us to consider in this day and age as well. Carrying forward on that theme, the last place that we would expect to find God is often where we find God. Like as a crucified Messiah, as a baby in a manger, as the one who humbly serves the need of another in a very quiet way. We continue to keep the x-ray vision of the gospel with the lens of faith available to us clear so that we can see more of these Christ encounters in our own day and age as well. Another theme from last week's session dealt with Paul lifting up the images you may remember of field and temple that one plants, the other one waters, but it is God who gives the growth, that God is the one who's in charge, and he invites us to see ourselves, not just the ancient Corinthians, but us too, as, as a field, as a temple, as things that grow, as things that are constructed in a very productive way. We look to carry those themes into our life as followers, as disciples of Jesus Christ in this day and age as well. But a question for our consideration now with the theme for this day. 
Where have we encountered self-centered actions or attitudes lately? Hmm. Well, perhaps we've seen a lot in the world as of late. Self-centered actions and attitudes. Is this the way of Jesus? Paul would definitely say, no way. And he's trying to get us to think again in ways that take the focus off of ourselves and onto the needs of the neighbor. So let's take a look at this first part of our theme for this day. Um, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. So if you have a Bible at home, again, you may know that I prefer the New Revised Standard Version translation of the Bible. Not that other translations aren't good. It's just that when I was going to seminary, a guy that I really loved and admired, a New Testament scholar by the name of John Luhmann, who was a Lutheran pastor. He's gone on now to the church triumphant. He was really known for his abilities with ancient Greek. And he highly recommended the NRSV translation as a really effective rendering of the ancient Greek into English. So that's the one that I stick to since I can't do translation of a Greek New Testament on the fly like some of my other pastoral colleagues are able to do. That is not one of my gifts. But I do have a keen interest in the accuracy of what is being said in a text. So I rely on an expert like Dr. Ruhlman uh, for his wisdom and word. He says this is a good translation. I'm sticking by what he has said. So anywho, let's read now these passages again. If you have a chance, I invite you to follow along at home. Chapters 6, verses 12 to 20. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy both, one and the other. The body is not meant for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a, a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said that the two shall be one flesh. For if anyone, but anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Here ends the first reading for our study today. I'm going to turn this off. You saw the title before. You don't need to see those other advertisements for Apple TV. Anywho. So Paul is, is getting at this issue of, of proper conduct in the body. But the theme that he's laying out is this, all things are lawful, not all things are beneficial. I don't know that that was original to him. I think that he may have heard it from people in Corinth, and he was trying to process and work with this slogan that was, was coming through. Because evidently, from what I've read, some of the Greek philosophies of Paul's day had, had, this, had, had described the body as either a tomb or a prison. 
The flesh is a tomb or a prison. And, and in some ways, maybe Paul might have picked up on that theme about flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, but in this day and age, it was, it was kind of a Gnostic principle. You may be familiar with some of the Gnostic Gospels. A, a professor by the name of Elaine Pagels, who, who taught, I don't know if she still teaches, but she taught for many years at, at Princeton. Um, she did a lot of work with translating Gnostic Gospels. These were these ancient texts from a, a dig in Egypt, referred to as Nag Hammadi, um, and, and rendering them into English so that we who don't know the ancient Greek languages and some of the other ancient texts can have access to what they are saying. Anyhow, um, there were various forms of Gnosticism that existed in the early church and occasionally in the world today, there are forms of Gnosticism that continues to uh, rear its head in, in our, our faith life. And, and one of these Gnostic principles was this idea that the body is really something that is, is, is useless or not important, so therefore you can even do whatever you want with it. It's almost like a type of hedonism attitude. And, and some of and some of the, uh, the um, Corinthians that were part of the faith community, the Christian community in ancient Greece, in Corinth, were evidently saying, well, you know, the body isn't important anyway, so it doesn't matter what I do, even if I happen to join myself to a prostitute. Why are you getting so bent out of shape about it? The, the body is not what inherits the kingdom of heaven, so, you know, what's it matter to you if this is what I do? is an argument that some of the Corinthians may have had with, with Paul in his teachings. You know, and, and that is kind of like this Gnostic principle. I, I did a study several years ago on these Gnostic principles, the Gnostic gospel of, of Judas. Remember Judas? Of course, he is, he is the disciple that betrayed, that betrayed Jesus. But in this, in this Gnostic gospel of Judas, Judas is actually the hero. Why is that? Because, because in the Gnostic Gospel, Jesus, he, Judas helps Jesus to, to destroy the, 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 the physical body, to, to, to help him to escape from this, this prison or this tomb, which is his body. Isn't that kind of way out there? <laughs> but but that's, that was one of the uh, philosophies that was, was popular during the day and, and one of the issues perhaps that, that Paul had to deal with in, in trying to get the the Christians who were basically just neophytes. Remember he was saying that he had to to um, feed them milk. They weren't ready for solid food. So he's helping, he's working his his best to try to bring them upright in faith. And he's trying to, I guess, reteach or, or move them away from some of the teachings that they may have known that were not very helpful, that were indeed a bit harmful. And this understanding that the body doesn't matter is one of these, these bad teachings that he, Paul, is trying to undo. So what does Paul do in these verses that I just shared with you? He calls the body a temple of the Holy Spirit. That temple theme was used in the verses that we looked at last week as well. He's basically saying that what you do in the body matters. The body is a gift. It is to be respected. Honor God in your body. And, and especially he's getting at this issue of honoring God in our sexual conduct. Faithfulness, that is a key word, I believe, that Paul would be raising up here. Or in, in, the, in the Hebrew, there is this word of chesed, chesed, which means faithfulness or steadfast love. Gets at the point that God ultimately is faithful and steadfast in his love for us. So therefore, we are to conduct ourselves, our behaviors in life in ways that mirror this steadfast love and faithfulness of our loving God to us. So, so Paul is, is really getting at that point as he tries to steer the Corinthians clear of fornication and other unethical conduct that evidently was going on in their bodies. 
I mean, Jesus himself models the importance of the body. The incarnation, Merry Christmas to you here in June, is one of the best examples that the creator of, of the whole universe, if, if he himself thought it was important enough to take a human form, a bodily form, which he did in the incarnation when Jesus was born in Bethlehem's manger, that in and of itself shows that the body is important or should be important to us as well. And, and our conduct in the body matters and it should be important to us as well. And then when Jesus rises again, the gospel writers were very clear that Jesus didn't just rise as some nebulous spirit person, but, but his, this, this resurrected body had some physical characteristics that it had pre-resurrection, right? Think about it. When Thomas was doubting at the end of John's gospel and, and, and he wanted to touch Jesus's nail prints, put his fingers in the nail prints and put his hand in the side where the centurion had sent a spear into Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. And Jesus made that special guest appearance. We appeared the second time to his disciples and to Thomas, just, I think, for Thomas, and invited Thomas to touch him so that he could see and, and, and feel for himself that Jesus was alive and real in a very bodily way. Maybe a new bodily way, but still a physical bodily way. Jesus appeared in Luke's Gospel at the end of, of Luke's Gospel uh, after the resurrection. While the disciples were out in the Sea of Galilee fishing, what was he doing? He was making breakfast, uh, fish for breakfast on the beach until they got in. And what was he doing? He was eating the fish to show them that, yes, I am alive in a physical way because ghosts or just spirits do not eat fish. So the importance, again, of the body being demonstrated through the resurrection appearances of Jesus. So, so Paul is trying to make this emphasis in Corinth, and he's trying to make that emphasis to us in this day and age as well. So therefore, we are called to be good stewards of, of creation, also to, to look for ways that are going to promote attitudes and, and an environment where the body can thrive to help our neighbor. I mean, for example, um, air quality. If you can't breathe, we all have been focusing on, or I, I like to focus us on the breath, as, as I do in my daily devotions. It's, it's a, 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 um, a prayer tool that many of you know that I use. Um, air quality is related to breathing, and if you don't breathe, your body, your physical body can't be supported. So are we engaged in policies that help to ensure that the air is clean for all of us to breathe? Healthcare, is that really accessible to everyone so that proper care can be given to people's bodies so that the bodies are able to do what our loving creator God wants them to do? Good food. I mean, some places, even in our own country, do not have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. These foods that have the powerful nutrients that help to keep our bodies healthy. These attitudes have current implications, you see? It's all kind of tied in here. Paul is saying the body's important, and when Paul says that the body is important, it really does have concrete, direct impact on our policies and how we live our life in this day and age. Body's important not just for us, but for our neighbor as well. Now, let's move on to the next set of verses in chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 to 33. And again, if you have a Bible at home, I invite you to follow along as I read aloud now. 
All things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. You see, Paul's picking up this theme. Didn't I just say that back in chapter 6? <laughs> I did. So it must be a pretty important theme because, again, Paul's picking it up here in chapter 10. All things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. He continues, all things are lawful, but not all things build up. Hmm. Not all things build up. Do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. There you go. The focus on the neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth and its fullness are the Lord's. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it out of consideration for the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I mean, the other's conscience, not your own conscience. For why should uh, my liberty be subject to the judgment of someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why should I be den denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So, whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Do everything for the glory of God. Very, very important concept. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. Okay, so there ends that passage. Lots of grounds here again, and now we're kind of, again, using this theme of all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All things are, are lawful, but not all things build up. Not all things build up. So what is, what is the specific issue that Paul's dealing with here? He's dealing with this issue of meat being offered to idols. Okay. You've seen, I tried to post some pictures over the past of ancient Corinth. There were all kinds of different temples and shrines to, to the gods in ancient Corinth. There was one prominent temple that's on the cover of our first, first week's discussion that was set up to the god Apollo, god of the sun. Um, I think he may have also been the god of war. I have to correct my check on that. But, but anywho, um, it, it would have been common for, for uh, sacrifices to take place in temples or shrines, sacrificing of animals. So there is meat then to eat, meat to be bought, sold, and, and then consumed. But before it's, it's, it's butchered and prepared for, for sale, oftentimes it had been part of a religious ritual to, to one of these gods or, or these daemons I've, I've heard referred to. D-A-I-M-O-N-S is, I believe, how it is spelled. Daemons were supposedly these, these um, issues or these spirits that kind of controlled the whole environment. So you wanted to keep the daemons happy and on your side, so if you offer the right sacrifice, then everything you hope will go well. And, and obviously, um, Paul's, Paul's saying, well, there aren't any daemons, and there aren't any other gods but the one Lord God, so all the meat is coming from the Lord God anyway, so if you go to someone's house, and you're going to eat, that's what they've given you meat to eat, eat the meat. And, and Paul was big about you no need to keep kosher either. He didn't want to have anything breaking down connections in the Christian community. He was really trying to, again, build up. That was the key theme. All things are lawful, not all things will build up. What is the need of the neighbor in any given set of circumstances? 
So, so you know, you go to a guest house and they provide you food. I mean, even in this day and age, it's it's not very nice to not eat the meal that has been provided for you. So, so you try to be a good guest, and and even more, you 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 try to be a good follower of Jesus by by how you live your life, by by what you you do in a guest house. So Paul says it's all right to eat meat that's been offered to idols, except if someone raises a concern. If someone says, hey, don't you know that 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 meat that you're eating was offered to such and such God or Damon? Um, What do you think of that? I I thought that we don't have believe in Damon's and these other idols and, and gods. In that instance, Paul was basically saying, well, then don't eat the meat. Not that you can eat the meat or shouldn't be able to eat meat, but because you don't want to do anything to create a stumbling stone to a neighbor's faith, you know, you don't you don't want to do that. Um, you want to build up the other's faith. So there's it's it's this whole theological context. Ministry is contextual. What is the most life-giving thing to do? What is the most loving thing to do in any given set of circumstances? And it, you may answer it differently depending on what the specific circumstances actually happen to be. And that's that's this applied theology that Paul is trying to model here. Um, you know, um, think about uh, the consumption of, of alcohol in our own day and age. You know, it's, it's, it's legal to consume alcohol within moderation, of course. But, but you may know of someone that has a sensitivity to alcohol. So, so therefore, you may be able to consume alcohol without any problems in, in proper moderation. But if you know that you're with someone that, that really is not able to have a, a good relationship with alcohol, then out of solidarity for the needs of your neighbor, probably the right thing to do in that instance would be not to consume alcohol yourself. See how this works? It really depends on the specific situation. What is the most life-giving thing to do? What is the most loving thing to do? What builds up? Always trying to be conscious of what the needs of the neighbor are. Thinking not of yourself. Remember the theme back here? It's not all about me. It's about the neighbor. That's what Paul's trying to emphasize because that is what Jesus emphasizes what he is trying to model here in in his teaching with the Corinthians. You know, another modern application of this theme, all things are lawful, but not all things build up, is is mask wearing. Are you wearing masks when you're out in public? Um, Science seems to indicate that um, maybe it is a good thing to wear masks when we are in public. Uh, Unless you have one of those N95, do I have number right and 95 are the masks that keep any type of uh, microbe away from you Um, any other mask that we wear is not necessarily going to help ourselves, but it protects neighbors or other people from from us if we happen to be carrying a pathogen in in our bodies so we wear a mask in this instance not primarily to protect ourselves but for the protection of our neighbor, because we're concerned about our neighbor's health and well-being, because Jesus has called us to be concerned about our neighbor's health and well-being. And he, above all, has demonstrated that type of an example in the way that he lived his life. So, so again, to kind of quote some of the uh, words of Martin Luther, uh, he wrote a tract called The Freedom of a Christian, back in the 16th century. And and one of the key themes of this freedom of a Christian is that we are not freed from service through the gospel. We are freed for service. Service in love for the benefit of our neighbor. So we we keep doing this concept of uh, making our RBGs. No, again, not Ruth Bader Ginsburg. RBG stands for Reverend Best Guesses. What is the most life-giving thing to do? What is the most loving thing to do? 
knowing that circumstances are not always clear. They're more often than not pretty gray, ambiguous. So in the midst of the ambiguity, we make our ever best guess, knowing that even if we have made a mistake and we are wrong, we are still absolved, forgiven, and freed again through this message of the gospel to go and try again. Keep trying to get it right. Keep trying to make a difference for good. Keep trying to spread love and word and deed in the world. All this from St. Paul here in his correspondence with the Corinthians. He had his hands full with the Corinthians. No doubt about it. They pushed him. I'm sure they tried his patience. But yet in this, this, this give and take, this back and forth, it's, it's like weightlifting. You, you, have that, you have that resistance and, and you get stronger that the Corinthians with their issues and their questions and their behavior help to make Paul theologically and, and faithfully stronger because he had to keep thinking about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in this set of circumstances. To keep doing that applied theology. So again, it's not about me. It's not about, it's not about my needs. It's about the neighbor's needs. Putting the needs of the neighbor first. It is moving from, from, from selfishness to selflessness. Focusing on the neighbor because that helps to build community. That helps to build the body of Christ. Not just in Corinth, in ancient times. Today as well. So next week, we are going to be focusing on the theme of what am I good for? If it's not all about me, then what am I good for? And we're going to be focusing especially on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses well, actually, I think it goes to verse 33 or 31. Look at the whole chapter, chapter 12, if you'd like to do some reading in preparation for our conversation next week. So we'll focus on 1 Corinthians chapter 12 for next week. And the theme of what am I good for? Probably a lot more than we think. So it's about all that I have to say for today's study. I thank you again for joining me for this opportunity to converse in the faith and to talk about the work of our brother in Christ, St. Paul, and how that work continues to have a positive impact in our life today. If you are able now, I would like you to invite you to join me in a closing prayer. Let us pray together those words that Jesus, our Lord, taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So, sisters and brothers in Christ, friends in faith, I'd like to thank you again for joining me here this afternoon. Please, oh please, continue to be safe, stay well, and God's peace be with you now and always.